Welcome to The Rule Dictator. My name is Corlith, your host, and this is how to play The Starfarers of Catan. The Starfarers of Catan is a game of space exploration, colonization, negotiation, and trade with a bit of very light combat thrown in. Although the game is intended and plays best with four people, three player games work very well. The winner is the first player to get to 15 victory points. The following contribute to your victory point total. Every colony is worth 1 point. Every spaceport is worth 2 points. Every pair of fame rings is worth 1 point. Every friendship chip is worth 2 points. Every defeated pirate base is worth a point. And every defeated ice planet is worth a point. Follow these steps when setting up a new game of the Starfarers of Catan. After unfolding the main board, take the four friendship chips and place them on their respective race on the board. There are five friendship trade agreement cards for each race. Place the cards on the respective place on the board as well. The cards can be placed face up as they are not kept secret at any time during play. Our group often calls this the assistance from Earth pile. To make this pile, select 12 cards from each of the 5 resource types and shuffle them together. This makes an initial deck of 60 cards. If this reserve is ever used up, pick 6 more cards from each resource type and shuffle them together. Each player takes a game overview card and 3 resource cards from the reserve. These cards make up the initial hand and are kept hidden from the other players. Concerning the resource chips, when it is face down, the color dot or Greek letter side is visible. The value of the chip is hidden. Find the five white dot resource chips and put them aside face down for now. They will come into play later. Take all of the resource chips that have a blue, red or yellow dot and turn them face down. Shuffle them around so that they are randomized and then place them on the game board. Every non-starting planet has a colored dot. Place one chip per planet matching it to the dot color. Match the resource chips with the Greek letters with the letters on the starting planets. Then, depending on whether you are using the beginner or advanced placement rules, do the following. For beginners, flip the chips and match the numbers to the locations as displayed in the game rulebook. This is the ideal layout for ensuring balanced resource availability for all players. When using advanced placement, flip the chips and leave them where they are. Each player selects a mothership. Note the color of the knob on the nose. This is your color for the game. Take all transporters, spaceport rings, colonies and trade outposts matching that color. This is your game piece reserve. From that reserve, pick out the following pieces that will be used as your starting pieces. One transporter, one spaceport ring, four colonies, and the victory point marker. Put the victory marker at the beginning of the scoring track. It starts at four points. Take a colony and a spaceport ring and put them together like this. This is your first spaceport. Take a colony and a transporter and put them together like this. This is your first colony ship. Finally, take one fame ring from the central reserve and attach it to your mothership. When using beginner setup, match the ship placement as shown on the first page of the rulebook. It's as easy as that. In the advanced setup, each player rolls two dice. Highest roller gets to go first. There are three rounds of placement and during each round, each player gets to claim one untaken location with a base. A base is either one of the two colonies or the spaceport. On the first round, starting with the first player and going clockwise around the table, each player picks an intersection to place a base. The person who placed last on the first round gets to go first on the second round. This time, go counterclockwise around the table. On the final round of placement, we're back to going clockwise, starting again with the first player. Make sure to consider where you put your spaceport when placing your bases. If you have it located near the back of the map, every new ship you build must travel further to get anywhere, putting you at a disadvantage. The advanced setup is pretty much the same as it was with four players. The placement turn order goes 1, 2, 3, 3, 2, 1, 1, 2, 3. You may take any available starting intersection during the setup phase of the game so it is acceptable to have a planet with all three intersections occupied and others with two, one, or none of the intersections being used. Once regular play has begun, moving ships to and colonizing the remaining starting locations is allowed, but be aware of this additional three-player rule. 
You may not colonize an intersection if the other two intersections of that planet have been taken. In other words, only two of the three spaces around a planet are allowed to be colonized during regular game play. This concludes the setup phase of the game. Starting with the first player, and proceeding clockwise around the table for the rest of the game, on his or her turn, each player does the following. Roll for resource production, trading and building, and space flight. There are five kinds of planets. They each produce one kind of resource in the Starfarers of Catan. They are carbon planets that generate carbon, food planets that produce food, fuel planets that synthesize fuel, ore planets that mine ore, and trade planets that make trade goods. As expected, the various ships and upgrades take specific resources to build them. Consult your reference card for the construction recipes. Let's explore how resource cards are acquired. First, roll two six-sided dice and add them together. If the result is not a seven, find every resource chip that matches the result and give a resource card matching that planet type to the player who has a colony or spaceport in the intersection adjacent to it. Let's say that an eight was rolled. The green player has two colonies beside a fuel planet and one colony beside a trade planet with an eight resource chip. Therefore, he gets three resource cards, two fuel and one trade good card. The red player has only one colony beside a resource chip with an 8, a food planet, so he gets one food card. The other players don't have any colonies next to an 8, so they don't get any cards. I've seen a number get rolled several times in a row, giving certain players a massive lead over the rest. To mitigate this, we've established the following house rule. When a player rolls the same number as the previous one, we reject it and get the player to roll again. If that player re-rolls twice and still gets the same number, we let it stand. We assume the deities of Catan must really want that number to come up this time. We also apply this house rule to rolls of 7, which will be discussed shortly. Statistically, the 6 and the 8 are the best resource chip numbers for colonies to be next to. However, I've seen games where those numbers are almost never rolled. And no, my dice are not loaded. In fact, I'm usually the one who gets burned sitting on a dead number. To counter this, some people have published a deck of cards that guarantee the correct distribution of possible die rolls. If you want to try it out, you can get the deck at BoardGameGeek.com and print them out. You may have noticed that there are no resource chips with a 7 on it. That's because when a 7 is rolled, Earth demands a tribute. Players familiar with other Catan games should recognize this mechanic. Every player who has more than 7 resource cards, including the one who rolled the 7, must discard half of them rounding down. Each player gets to pick which of his cards he returns to the bank. A player with 8 cards would lose 4, whereas a player holding 9 cards would also return 4 cards to the bank, but keep 5. Finally, as a reward for bringing in the tribute, the player that rolled the 7 may take 1 card, at random, from a player of his choice. A player who is holding 7 or less resource cards doesn't discard any, but he can still have one stolen by the player that rolled the 7. Our group also uses this house rule in regards to rolling a 7. A 7 is not allowed for the first two rounds of the game. This means that every player gets two full turns before a roll of a 7 is accepted. Also, when playing with very young players who get upset with the official 7 roll, i.e. losing cards and or having cards stolen, we have the person who rolled the 7 pick a card from the Assistance from Earth Reserve. Nothing else happens. Obviously, this is not a highly competitive game. As long as your score is 8 or less, you may get assistance from Earth. This assistance comes in the form of drawing a resource card from the supply pile. There is a variant published with the game that allows for drawing two cards from the supply pile if your score is six or less. Our group often uses it as it speeds up the game and gets us out of the early game faster where very little happens. This makes the overall experience more fun and exciting. In this phase, the active player can trade cards with other players, trade cards with the bank, build ships, and add mothership expansions. These can be done in any order and as often as you like. Trading a card and then building one thing, and then trading more cards to buy another is common practice. You can keep going until you run out of cards, or are happy with what you have. The active player can make offers of what he wants in exchange for what he's willing to give up. Other players can also make offers to the active player. Counter and counter counter offers can go on as long as necessary. However, non-active players may not trade between each other. The five face-up resource piles represents the Galactic Bank. A player may perform the following exchanges as often as he wants and can. It takes two trade good cards to get a resource card of your choice. 
For the other four resource types, it takes three of the same cards to get a card of your choice. During your turn, you may build spaceships, upgrade colonies to spaceports, and add expansions to your mothership. Here are the specifics. There are two kinds of starships, colony ships and trade vessels. To build a colony ship, you must pay the Galactic Bank one ore, one food, one fuel, and one carbon. To assemble the ship, take a colony base from your reserve and mount a transporter on top of it. You may not build a colony ship if all three of your transporters are already in use on the board. All of your colony base pieces are already in use on the board, or all of your spaceport intersections are occupied. A colony ship allows you to travel to a planet cluster and establish a colony at one of the three intersections. Each colony grants the following benefits. One victory point. When the resource dice total matches the number on the chip beside your base, you get a resource card matching the planet type. A colony can be upgraded to a spaceport, allowing you to launch new ships much closer to the other planets than from your home world spaceport. To build a trade ship, you must pay one ore, one fuel, and two trade goods. To assemble the ship, take a trade outpost base and mount a transporter onto it. You may not build a trade ship when all of the transporters are already in use on the board, all of your trade outpost pieces are already in use on the board, or all of your spaceport intersections are occupied. A trade ship can be used to form trade agreements with the various friendly aliens in the game. A trade agreement grants the following benefit. If you are the holder of the friendship chip, you get two victory points. Gaining and losing these chips is discussed a bit later. Every trade agreement comes with a friendship card that also provides a benefit. The friendship cards are also discussed a bit later. Upgrading a colony to a spaceport costs three carbon and two food. Take a spaceport ring and put it onto the desired colony. Ships can be built and launched from the new spaceport on the same turn it was upgraded. As expected, you may not build a spaceport if all the spaceport rings are already in use. The benefits of having a spaceport closer to the action is obvious. The mothership can be upgraded with the following expansion modules. Boosters cost two fuel and allow all of your ships to move one extra space per turn. Boosters are also used to determine the outcome of some encounters. Cannons cost two carbon and improve the combat strength of your ships, which is useful when fighting pirates and defeating pirate bases. Finally, freight rings are used for trade agreements with the friendly aliens and defeating ice planets. A mothership may have no more than six boosters, six cannons, and five freight rings. We now move on to the flight phase, where your ships move around in space. First things first, if you have no starships in play at this time, your turn ends here. As long as you have at least one ship on the board, you do the following. Roll the mothership to see if you have an encounter, and then move your ships. To roll the mothership, pick it up and turn it upside down and then right side up again. Two balls will fall into the transparent cup at the bottom. If you get two color balls, no encounter occurs. Based on the reference card, add up the value of the balls, boosters, and trade agreement cards that grant additional speed to determine how far your ship can move. If a player rolled a blue ball and a red ball, has two booster modules and no trade agreement cards that grant speed, all of his ships can travel up to six intersections this turn. If one of the balls is the black one, you've encountered something. I will discuss encounters in detail shortly. For now, I'll give you the speed calculation. Assuming that you have a ship that can move after the encounter has been resolved, you calculate your speed by adding three to the number of boosters and trade agreement cards that grant speed. Whenever an encounter occurs, ignore the color ball when deciding the speed of the ship. The base speed is always three. This ship had an encounter, has one booster and a double booster trade agreement card. Every ship in his fleet can move six intersections. When moving a ship, each line between intersection points counts as one step. If the player rolled a speed of four for this turn, every ship he has can move up to four steps on the map. A ship may pass through the same intersection many times in a turn. A ship may pass through an intersection that contains another ship, a colony, a spaceport, or a trade outpost. A ship may not end its movement adjacent to another player's spaceport, as this could prevent a player from launching a new ship, or in the same space as another object. A colony ship may not end its movement on a trade outpost location. 
A trade ship may not end its movement on any colonization location. Although a ship doesn't normally have to move, if it is a colony ship parked on a colonization intersection, it must move as soon as it legally can unless the owner turns it into a colony. As you know, when the black ball is rolled, an encounter has occurred. Here is what you do. The player to the left of the active player becomes the encounter player, draws an encounter card and reads it carefully before playing it out. An encounter can be any of the following. A merchant who will ask for a donation of up to three resources. A pirate who will either attack you, be attacking a friendly alien, offer you a shady deal, or masquerading as a merchant trying to solicit a donation that he plans to run away with. A wormhole which can grant a space jump. A distress call from a friendly alien whose ship is falling into a sun. A visit from the travelers, the most revered race in the galaxy. If you make a good donation to them, they will grant you a boon. It is usually a good idea to try and keep a couple of resources on hand in case you meet them. And wear and tear. This card usually causes all players to lose an expansion to, well, wear and tear. Once that card has been resolved, the encounter player shuffles the deck and draws another encounter card. If another wear and tear card is drawn, reshuffle and draw again. If things go badly, here are the kind of unfavorable results you can suffer. The first ship in your fleet breaks down and cannot move. Every ship has a number of knobs on the nose of the ship. The ship in play with the least amount of knobs is the first ship. A mothership expansion can be stolen or destroyed. Or you could lose a fame ring. If the loss breaks a pair, for example dropping from 6 rings to 5, you lose a victory point. Lower your score on the victory track. These are the possible favorable results for when things go well. You are given or get to pick resource cards. You could gain a fame ring. If that ring becomes a pair to another ring, for example going from 5 to 6 rings, you gain a victory point. Advance your score on the victory track. You're granted a free expansion. And finally, you could be given a trade ship. If you have no available transporters or all of your spaceport intersections are occupied, you may construct and place the spaceship on the board as soon as you are able to. And finally, you could be awarded a space jump. A space jump lets you move the first ship in your fleet to any unoccupied intersection on the board that it can legally use. Colony ships may explore, defeat obstacles and settle as usual. Trade ships can also explore, defeat obstacles and establish trade outposts. These are the spaceship activities associated with planets. A planet can be explored from any of these locations by a trade ship. A colony ship can use these intersections as well. When exploring, you take a peek at the value of the chip without showing it to anyone else. This way, only you know if the planet hides a good number, a bad number, or an obstacle that must be defeated before it can be colonized. If you have any movement, you can keep going after exploring a planet. This is what you do when you want to establish a colony at a planetary intersection. Check the two resource chips on the planets next to the intersection your colony ship occupies and make sure that neither contains an ice planet or a pirate lair. If one of them is a pirate lair, there will be a number of cannons listed on the chip. Your mothership must have at least that many cannons to defeat it. If you don't have enough cannons, you must move away if you have any movement left. If one of them is an ice planet, a number of freight rings will be listed on the chip. Your mothership must have at least that many freight rings to defeat it. If you don't have enough, you must move away if you have any movement left. If you have the required number of cannons or freight rings, keep the chip as it is worth one victory point. Advance your token on the victory point track and then pick one of the white dot resource chips from the reserve and peek at it, then place it face down on the planet you just cleared. If you like it, you are entitled to establish a colony right away. If you are able and want to colonize on that location, remove the transporter from the colony module and return it to the reserve. Flip the two resource chips adjacent to the new colony to their numbered side. Once a colony has been established, it is permanent. In a three-player game, no more than two of the three planetary intersections may be colonized. Making trade agreements with the friendly aliens of the galaxy is a necessary and exciting aspect of the Starfarers of Catan. On top of the victory points you get when you are the holder of friendship chips, each agreement carries an advantage that is well worth the effort. So let's dive in. With the exception of the Travelers, each friendly alien has a homeworld with five spots dedicated to establishing trading outposts. 
They are numbered 1 to 5. To set up a trade outpost, build a trade ship and fly to the lowest numbered outpost location of the friendly alien with whom you desire a trade agreement. As long as your mothership has at least the number of freight rings as the location number you are trying to use, you may establish your outpost. Next, look through the available friendship cards for this alien and pick one of them. The benefit described on the card is applied right away. Last but not least, if the friendship chip is unclaimed, take it and advance your score by 2 points on the victory track. If another player has the friendship chip and you have more outposts with that alien than anyone else, take the chip from that player. You advance your score by 2 and the player who lost the chip decreases his score by 2. If two people have the same number of established outposts with a friendly alien, the one whose outpost occupies the lowest numbered location gets the chip. So if red takes location 1, he gets the chip. Green comes over and takes location 2. Although there is a tie, Red owns the lowest number location so he keeps the chip. Green then establishes an outpost at location 3 and takes the chip. Red comes back and takes location 4. It's a tie again, but since Red owns the one location, he takes the chip back. In another example, if Blue takes location 1, he gets the chip. Red comes along and takes position 2. After Green takes position 3 and 4, the chip goes to Green. If Red takes position 5, he will claim the chip from green since he owns the lowest numbered location of the tied players. As you can imagine, fighting over the friendship chips gets pretty fierce near the end of the game. One more thing, once a trade outpost has been established, it's permanent. You can never lose it, even if your mothership loses the required number of freight rings it took to establish it. This also means that you can never lose a friendship card. The bonuses you gain from those cards are yours for the rest of the game. The friendly aliens are all quite different from one another. The green people excel at improving production gains. The merchants obviously make trade with the galactic bank more profitable. The scientists help improve the speed and weaponry of the ships in your fleet. And the diplomats help to improve your notoriety, your odds of getting resources and reducing taxation tariffs. Naturally, the friendship cards reflect the personality and style of the alien races that offer them. Each alien has 5 cards, which coincides with the number of trade outpost spots around their homeworlds. Each friendship card of the green people grants a production increase, as identified on the card, of one of the 5 resources. When your colonies generate at least one resource that matches the resource identified on the card, you collect an additional resource of that type. Each friendship card can only grant one additional resource card of its type per roll of the resource dice. For example, the blue player has the ore and fuel friendship cards. A roll of 5 would normally grant 1 ore and 2 fuel. The friendship cards contribute an ore and a fuel bringing the total of collected cards to 2 ore and 3 fuel. In a similar vein to the green people, each friendship card with the merchants decreases the exchange rate when dealing with the galactic bank for the resource type identified on the card. You can trade 2 ore resources for one other resource as often as you like. You can trade two carbon resources for one other resource as often as you like. You can trade two fuel resources for one other resource as often as you like. You can trade two food resources for one other resource as often as you like. The trade good card is slightly different. You can exchange one trade good for another resource only one time per turn. After the initial discount, for any other exchanges of trade goods made this turn, use the normal 2 to 1 ratio. The scientists specialize in improving the effectiveness of spaceships. The friendship cards either strongly improve ship speed, strongly improve the cannons, or slightly improve both speed and cannons. The nice thing about the friendship card based improvements is that they do not count as ship modules. Say an encounter card instructs you to lose a cannon module but the only cannon upgrades you have are from friendship cards, you are unaffected. This also means that you can have cannons and booster effectiveness beyond the number of modules that can be attached to your ship. For example, if you had purchased 6 cannon modules, you may not buy any more as there is no room for them on your mothership. Getting friendship cards that grant extra cannon power is the only way to push your weapon strength past the module limit. A good thing since there is a pirate base out there that takes 7 cannons to beat it. The friendship cards you can get with the diplomats are the most unusual, so I save them for last. Fame for sale lets you buy fame rings with trade good resources. There is a limit though, you may not purchase any more if you already have 6 fame rings. 
The helping hand lets you, during your trade and build phase, select up to two other players that have more victory points than you and draw one card from each of them at random. If there is only one player with more victory points, you can only draw one card from his hand. If no one has more victory points than you, you're out of luck. That being said, if you're not eligible to draw cards, you're either tied for first or are winning, so stop being so greedy. Reduced Tribute lets you safely hold up to 12 cards instead of the usual 7. You only discard half your hand on a roll of a 7 if you have 13 cards or more. The player that rolled the 7 is still allowed to draw a card from you. The Galactic Relief Fund lets you draw a resource card of your choice from the Galactic Bank if the production roll from any player grants you no resources from your colonies and spaceports. You may not draw a card if the production dice roll was a 7. And that's it! You have everything you need to play the Starfarers of Catan. If you want to look up more details online, such as the 6 player expansion rules and more, check out the Wikipedia Starfarers of Catan page. Thank you for watching this video, good luck, have fun, and I will see you next time.